the world's so-called war on drugs has been an utter failure. Drug gangs are as strong as ever and trying to confront them with police raids and arrests has only created a vicious cycle of poverty and violence around the globe. In the words of NGO Health Poverty Action, the people most affected by the war on drugs are not those in charge of selling illegal substances. Instead, it's those caught up at the lowest levels of the trade, an industry that is destroying their lives and their communities. A group of legal scholars and health experts was designated by Brazil's House of Representatives to propose changes to the current Drugs Act. The committee presented this report, lobbying for the decriminalization of drug consumption, but suggesting tougher penalties on illegal trade. The report is not very extensive in its modernization of the current rules, but tries to eliminate gray areas that are usually detrimental to black and poor communities. This week we discuss Brazil's war on drugs and what the country should do to curb one of its worst problems right now. This episode was produced by Maria Marta Bruno and Ewan Marshall. My name is Gustavo Ribeiro, editor-in-chief of the Brazilian Report, and this is Explaining Brazil. Brazil's approach to drugs has historically been one of prohibition. Increasingly harsh penalties for trafficking have been the norm, and defendants have seen their access to bail or pretrial release reduced since 1990, when the state considered drug trafficking a heinous crime, on par with kidnapping, first-degree murder, and rape. Back in 2006, Congress passed a new drug law, sanctioned by then-President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva. It was presented at the time as a groundbreaking change, as it would no longer throw drug users in jail, as long as they weren't selling forbidden substances. Thirteen years later, the legislation led to an incredible hike in drug-related arrests. Currently, one-third of Brazilian arrests are drug cases. In Paraná, a state bordering Paraguay and a notorious drug route, the rate jumps to 59%. Since the law was passed, Brazil's prison population has increased by 339% and only trails the US and China, countries with much larger populations. The 2006 Drugs Act raised minimum sentences for drug trafficking from 3 to 5 years. It also gave judges amazing powers over defendants, according to Julita Lengruber, a sociologist who used to be the ombudswoman of Rio's police department and currently serves as coordinator for the Center of Safety and Citizenship Studies at Cândido Mendes University in Rio. This legislation gives the judge complete freedom to analyze each case depending on the uh, accused profile and where the person lives and the law says uh, the judge should regard the personal and social circumstances of the crime and of course this was like a blank check for the judges to begin incarcerating more and more black kids, poor kids, mainly kids that live in the poor areas of the big cities in Brazil. So it was, uh, uh, it was something that in the beginning people thought that it was going to be a big change. But then the legislation itself is racist and it's classist. The numbers do corroborate what Dr. Langruber says. Last year, Agência Pública, a non-profit journalistic organization, analyzed over 20,000 drug-related criminal cases. It found that white defendants have 35% more chance of getting away with drug use charges rather than being considered dealers. While black and mixed race people represent 55% of the overall population, they account for 64% of prison inmates, and most of the defendants arrested as drug dealers, didn't have any priors. While males are the worst affected segment of the population, the war on drugs has also taken a heavy toll on women. 
64% of female prisoners in Brazil are there for drug-related offenses, most of whom get involved in the narcotic business to help their relatives or their partners. What the war on drugs approach flatly ignores is the role of income inequality on the drug problem, are often driven into these activities by situations of marginality. Despite figuring as one of the world's top 10 economies, Brazil is also one of the most unequal places on earth. Someone earning the minimum wage would have to work for 19 years just to make what one of the top 0.1% makes in one month. And treating these people solely as irreparable criminals has only perpetuated a cycle of violence and poverty. Shootings have become part of everyday life for residents in gang-dominated slums, especially in Rio de Janeiro. Last year, the police killed more than 1,400 people, only in the state of Rio. This is a much higher number than all the police forces in the U.S. This is crazy. You know, the, the big cities in Brazil, the only public policy that poor people uh, receive in the favelas is a rifle pointed at them. There is a, a, a fantastic journalist, author of a book uh, discussing the war on drugs, which is called Chasing the Scream. His name is Johan Hari, and he said only in occupied Palestine he had seen police pointing their rifles at the local population, pointing the rifle at children. It's getting much worse now with a very, very conservative, ultra-right government. The physical manifestations of the chronic effects of the war on drugs are not restricted to Rio either. In Sao Paulo, the country's biggest city, entire blocks of the city center have become open-air drug markets. The notorious Cracolândia, or Crackland, is a 24-hour spot for drug trafficking and use, gathering hundreds upon hundreds of addicts at any one time. Crackland has been the subject of a series of initiatives by the Sao Paulo Municipal Administration, which, in keeping with the failed tactics of the war on drugs in the rest of the country, are usually based on increasing policing, arrests and forced rehabilitation. Strategies are rarely more sophisticated than sending in a bunch of well-armed police to disperse the addicts, but this only lasts for a matter of days before the flow of crack users return to crackland. However, in 2014, the Open Arms program was launched in Sao Paulo to some real success. In an attempt to reduce damage, hundreds of addicts were given financial stipends in exchange for labor, helping to reintegrate them into society. The program was praised worldwide, but when city mayor Fernando Haddad lost re-election, it was scrapped almost immediately. The mayor of Sao Paulo, João Doria, says Cracolândia no longer physically exists. Critics say the city is treating the addicts as criminals and wants to clear a downtown area ripe for development. Most people in Brazil don't care really don't care about the, the, the fate of these people. They just want, they don't want to see this, this misery. And the crack, the crack land is like the misery in the downtown. <laughs> crack land is not just a health problem or a social problem, now it's a political problem. Last year, Speaker of the House of Representatives Rodrigo Maia commissioned a group of legal scholars and health experts to examine Brazil's drug legislation and come up with some proposals to modernize the existing laws. Last week, the group submitted its report suggesting changes to be debated upon by Congress. The biggest change of all concerns the differentiation between drug users and drug dealers. As we mentioned earlier, the distinction between the two is arbitrary and often decided by police officers and judges, and racked with racial profiling and discrimination. Under this new proposal, however, Brazil's legislation would establish objective criteria to define what makes someone a drug user and what makes someone a drug dealer. The report suggests using quantities of controlled substances to define what is personal use, 
and what is possession with intent to sell. Anyone caught with more than 10 doses of a given drug would be treated as a drug trafficker. Anything less would come under personal use. If properly implemented, the proposal could greatly reduce the number of people serving prison sentences for drug dealing. And while the idea was reasonably well received, there's an argument that things are not going far enough. Dr. Langruber has dedicated much of her academic work to championing the legalization of drugs as an alternative to the currently ineffective policies. All the work I have been doing in the past few years is trying to uh, challenge the notion that we're going to get anywhere with the so-called war on drugs. What's going on in the favelas, what's going on in the poor areas is small drug trafficking, is the retail drug trafficking. So the big thing is not going on in the poor areas, not in Brazil, not in the US. So, you know, hypocritically, we try to defend this idea that we're making our societies safer we're making our societies unsafe. A police that kills a lot, dies a lot. While the idea of legalizing drugs is unlikely to have much purchase in Brazil's current Congress, arguably the most conservative in the country's recent history, Dr. Langruber's stance is shared by many important public figures. One such figure is former President Fernando Henrique Cardoso. In 2012, working with the Global Commission on Drug Policy, he took part in the documentary Breaking the Taboo, where he called for the legalization of controlled substances to be a solution to the disastrous war on drugs. Stop pretending that repressive drug laws alone protect the people. They do not and will not. People dependent on drugs should be treated as patients, not criminals. The anti tobacco campaigns prove that cultural values and patterns of behavior can change if people are told the truth encourage to act responsibly. However, the current president is not in agreement. When discussing the legalization of cannabis, Jair Bolsonaro is firmly opposed to the idea, constantly repeating his claim that 99% of parents would agree with him. Vou perguntar para qualquer pai se ele é favorável a liberar as drogas. Eu acho que 99% são contra, até porque ela vai chegar nas escolas. Most Brazilians remain unfavorable to the legalization of drugs. However, public opinion is changing. In the mid-90s, only 17% of the country supported the decriminalization of cannabis. Since then, that rate has nearly doubled. Experts point out that society is looking at some drugs differently due to recent discoveries of the medicinal use they might have. And data shows that medicinal cannabis is already a reality in Brazil, over the past three and a half years, over 78,000 units of cannabis-based products have been legally brought into Brazil. Our court system has also recently allowed families to grow cannabis at home to treat some diseases. The first such case was in November 2016, as a Rio de Janeiro court authorized a family to grow marijuana at home to treat their seven-year-old daughter who suffered from a rare type of epilepsy. Since then, other judges have ruled in line with this decision, but producing medicine on a larger scale remains illegal in Brazil. Several associations have recently filed suit to be granted the right to produce medical marijuana and help thousands of patients who haven't responded to more traditional treatments, a legal battle set to run and run for years to come. If you like this podcast, please rate us on whatever platform you use for listening to podcasts. It will really help us. And take a look at our website, it's brazilian.report. Every day, we have new content about Brazilian politics, finance, and society. We have also got exclusive newsletter services if you want to be briefed on what's going on in Brazil before starting your day. Subscribe now to our free trial and enjoy all of our content for 7 days. And it's really free. You don't have to submit any credit card information whatsoever. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter 
Our handle is at Brazilian Report. And that's all for now. See you next week. Mm-hmm.